Hey, Indy, what you got there? Why don't you let me take that and my friends and I can test it out? My friends and I took a look and we think that it's corn. Specifically corn from ancient Mesoamerica. But what we want to truly sort out is what kind of corn it is and if it's been processed. The ancient peoples of Mesoamerica had a technique of processing corn called niche tamalization. This is a form of lime processing. No, 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 not the citrus. By lime, I mean an alkaline substance such as wood ash, limestone, or shells. And the process makes corn more nutritious by increasing the availability of calcium, niacin, dietary fiber, and essential amino acids, and is also thought that nishtamalization makes it easier to preserve the corn. Therefore, nishtamalized corn might show up more in the archaeological record. We found a map of the different structures of corn, but we realized that all five might have been too many corn types to test all at once. So we landed on flint, flour, and dent corn structures for our test. We felt like the flint and popcorn were kind of similar, so we opted for something that wasn't going to explode on us when we heated it. And then we decided that sweet corn was kind of just a little weirdo, and we didn't want to deal with it, so we didn't. We selected our corn species based on what corns are closely related to those that they had in ancient Mesoamerica, and most closely related to the corn that Indy dug up earlier in the video. We selected Shokoyo, which is a flint corn, Olutio, which is a dent corn, and then Cacoacintle, which is a flower corn. And once we had all of these collected, we could begin the process. We started nishtamalizing these in little clay pots, putting half a cup of each corn in about three cups of water, and then a teaspoon and a half of calcium hydroxide as our alkaline substance, letting everything come to a boil, and then reducing it to a simmer. While we did that, we took measurements of some of the dry corn kernels to get an approximation of what size the non nishtamalized kernel of each kind of corn we were testing is. Now, we have a small reference collection of measurements for different kinds of non nishtamalized corn in the archaeological record, which is step one and will help Indy know if his corn has been processed or not. But more on that later. We let the nishtamalized corn sit to fully cool after an hour of simmering on the stove. After about 12 hours, we measured the nishtamalized kernels the same as the dry ones, and then we got started on firing them. We put about 20 of dry and nishtamalized kernels into these ceramic crucibles and placed them into our roaring fire. We let them cook for about an hour and a half, checking on our test kernels about every 20 to 30 minutes, and what we found after was actually really, really surprising. First things first, our test kernels gave us a really interesting show about where the heat was and wasn't concentrated, but because we continued to open and close these two crucibles, we decided to not include anything related to our test kernels in our final results. It was just, we wanted to see how cooked our kernels were and when we could stop. Now, onto our interesting results. The dried kernels had coagulated into a giant mutant clump of charred corn, while the processed kernels stayed relatively uniform and were just sort of charred versions of their normal selves. Isn't that amazing? Never, never mind. Anyway, results time. First things first, all of the corns we selected behaved differently because, well, Obviously, they're all different. Our biggest conclusion, however, is that we can say that the most well-preserved corn in the archaeological record is very likely going to be nishtamalized corn. The corn we processed fared just far better once carbonized than the dry corn did, if we think back to our mutant hunk of carbonized corn. We think it might have to do with the amount of starch in each of the corns and how the starch affected nishtamalization. The shokoyo corn didn't change much throughout the process because it's not starchy. It starts with the lowest weight before processing and ends with the lowest weight after firing, and its only significant change in numbers was from firing. The lower amount of starch with it being a flint corn might mean that there is a lower water absorption, making nishtamalization just less effective. Our flower corn, the cacahuasitle, has no hard outer shell and has the highest starch content, making it so it's most affected by nishtamalization and then by the firing. It gained the most weight from nishtamalization and then lost the most weight from firing. While this is different than the other two corns, it's not overly surprising. 
The Olatio behaved similar to our flint core in the Shokoyo, which is a little bit disappointing as I was hoping that the dent would make it so it was like super weird and behaved differently, but it had the same peaks just with different numbers. So it behaves very similarly to the Shokoyo because it's similar in structure. With this project, we were able to determine that processed corn through niche tonalization is much more likely to appear in the archaeological record, showing that if you find something that looks identifiable to corn in the archaeological record, it is very likely to have been lime processed. Well, yeah, but in its country of origin, right? Right, Indy? In its, in its country of origin, Indy?